President, we have a national emergency. This is one of the things that we can shoot first and ask questions later. Uh, normally you can't do that. All of a sudden these trees started moving out of the way. They parted for me. And then I came out into this opening and there where I saw Jesus Christ. an American socialist. Norman Thomas, six times candidate for president on the Socialist Party ticket, said the American people would never vote for socialism. But he said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adopt every fragment of the socialist program. He is more imminent. More imminent, more imminent. James Madison, 1788, speaking to the Virginia Convention, said, Since the general civilization of mankind... I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachment of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. When men were free. Broadcasting live from a secret location buried deep below the earth, you're about to make a connection to the signs of the times. W. Dean Shook is live on the air right now. Welcome into End Time News. I'm your host, W. Dean Shook. Thank you for being here. And let me say welcome to our national and our international audience and everyone who's listening on the iHeartRadio Network, the Spreaker Radio Network, and of course the Blog Talk Radio Network. I want you folks to uh, listen up in the UK, uh, Australia, France, Germany. Um, all of you listen up because as we go through this middle part of the program and beyond, this very much involves all of you too since we're going to talk tonight about a global issue which may very well usher in World War III. We're going to take a look at that, look at the history, and look at what's prophesied, what we're told is going to happen, and let's see if they match up. This is going to be an interesting discussion. I hope everyone will stick with me. We're going to start with uh, a history of about the last hundred years, um, with the beginning of America, because uh, this is really uh, a an important starting point. Now, in the spring of 1861, decades of simmering tension between the North and the South in the United States over issues including states' rights versus federal authority. You know, there was a westward expansion of slavery that exploded in the Civil War. The election of an anti-slavery Republican, uh, Abraham Lincoln, as president in 1860, caused even Southern states to secede from the Union. They formed what was called Confederate States of America. Four more joined them after the first shots of the Civil War were fired. Four years of brutal conflict was marked by historic battles in Bull Run and Chancellorville, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and others. The war between the states, the Civil War, pitted neighbor against neighbor. In some cases, brother against brother. By the time it ended... In Confederate surrender in 1865, the Civil War proved to be the costliest war ever fought on American soil, with some 620,000 of 2.4 million soldiers killed and millions more injured, and the population of the territory of the South had been devastated. In 1854, U.S. Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This essentially opened up new territories to slavery, by asserting the rule of popular sovereignty over congressional edict. Pro- and anti-slavery forces struggled violently in what was called the Bleeding of Kansas, while the opposition to the act in the North led to the formation of the Republican Party, a new political entity based on the principle of opposing slavery's extension into Western territories, and after the Supreme Court ruling in the Dred Scott case in 1857 confirmed the legality of slavery in these territories, the abolitionist John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry in 1959 convinced more and more Southerners that their northern neighbors were really bent on the destruction of this particular institution, being slavery. Lincoln's election in November of 1860 was the final straw. Within three months, seven southern states... South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, 
Louisiana, and Texas has seceded from the United States. In the early mornings of April 12, 1861, rebels opened fire at Fort Sumner at the entrance of the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. This was the first encounter of what would be the bloodiest war in the history of the United States. After a 34-hour bombardment, Major Robert Anderson surrendered his command to about 85 soldiers to some 5,500 Confederate troops under PGT Beauregard. Within weeks, four more southern states, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina, left the Union to join the Confederacy. Now, with war on the land, President Lincoln called for 75,000 militiamen to serve for three months. He proclaimed a naval blockade of the Confederate states. Now, although he insisted that they did not legally constitute a sovereign country, but were instead states in rebellion, he also directed the Secretary of the Treasury to advance two million to assist in the raising of troops. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus, first along the East Coast and ultimately throughout the country. The Confederate government had previously authorized a call for 100,000 soldiers for at least six months of service. This figure was soon increased to 400,000. George B. McCullen, who replaced the aging General Winfield Scott as Supreme Commander of the Union Army at first months of the war, was beloved to his troops. But his reluctance to advance frustrated Lincoln. In the spring of 1862, McCullen finally led his army at the Potomac up the peninsula between the New York and James Rivers. He captured Yorktown on May 4th. The combined forces of Robert E. Lee and Jackson successfully drove back his army in the seven-day battle. Lee then moved his troops northward. He split his men, sending Jackson to meet Pope's forces near Manassas, while he himself moved separately with the second half of the army. On August 29th, his troops, led by John Pope, struck Jackson's forces in the Second Battle of Bull Run. The next day, Lee hit the Federal left flank with a massive assault, driving Pope's men backwards toward Washington. On the heel of this victory at Manassas, Lee began his first Confederate invasion to the north. Despite contradictory orders from Lincoln and Halleck, McClellan was able to reorganize his army and strike at Lee. Now, Lee, having a decisive victory at Antietam, issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation, which freed all slaves to the rebellious states after January 1, 1863. He justified his decision as a wartime measure, but he didn't go as far as to free the slaves in the border states that were loyal to the Union. Still, the Emancipation Proclamation deprived the Confederacy of the bulk of its labor forces. It put international public opinion strongly on the Union side. Some 186,000 black soldiers joined the Union Army by the time the war ended in 1865. 38,000 of them lost their lives. In the spring of 1863, Hooker's plans for a Union offensive were thwarted by a surprise attack by the bulk of Lee's forces, whereupon Hooker pulled his men back to Chancellorville. The Confederates gained a costly victory in that battle that followed, suffering 13,000 casualties, around 22% of their troops. The Union lost 17,000 men, about 15%. Lee launched another invasion in the north in early June attacking Union forces commanded by General George Meade on July 1st near Gettysburg in southern Pennsylvania. Over three days of fierce fighting, the Confederates were able to push through the Union Center and suffered casualties of close to 60%. Meade failed to counterattack, however, and Lee's remaining forces were able to escape into Virginia, ending the last Confederate invasion in the North. Also in 1863, Union forces under Ulysses S. Grant took Vicksburg. This was a victory that would prove to be the turning point of the war for the Western Theater. After a Confederate victory at Chickamauga Creek, Georgia, just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, in September, Lincoln expanded Grant's command, and he led a reinforced Federal Army, including two corps from the Army of the Potomac, to victory in Chattanooga in late November. Shortly after the war, it turns out that John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington on April 14th. 
At that point, Sherman received Johnston's surrender at Durham Station, North Carolina, on April 26th, effectively ending the Civil War. As a result, the Civil War had more than 620,000 men killed, with millions more injured. And for what? It was for the freedom of America and of all American citizens. It was for the Gettysburg Address and our Bill of Rights. On June 21st, 1788, the Constitution of the United States was ratified and the nation was born. The ratification process was difficult and often controversial. Many of the founding fathers were worried that the Constitution didn't go far enough to limit the power of the federal government and protect the individual liberties of people in America. Some of the founders refused to sign the Constitution without first being assured of an additional Bill of Rights. So, in order to get everyone to agree on the Constitution, a series of 20 amendments were proposed by James Madison and supported by the author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. Ten of these were sent by Congress to the states on September 25, 1789. Madison and the other founders knew from experience and history that strong centralized government is a threat to both freedom and prosperity. So the Bill of Rights was created in order to prevent the government from becoming too powerful. But how did James Madison come up with these amendments? To answer that question, we have to understand a little bit about the world in the 18th century. Beginning with the early scientists like Descartes and Isaac Newton in the middle of the 1600s and culminating around the beginning of the 1800s, this historical period is known as the Age of Enlightenment. During this period, Western philosophers advanced the idea that all human beings were born with certain inalienable rights, which should not be infringed by anyone, even governments, lords, and kings. While there are many influential thinkers of this time, including many of the United States founding fathers such as Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, it was British philosopher John Locke who first asserted that all people have three basic natural rights. First, everyone has a right to their own life. Second, everyone has the right to liberty. Third, everyone has a right to keep and own property. In essence, this means that you should not be murdered, enslaved, or robbed by anyone else, including by agents of the government. American revolutionary Thomas Paine elaborated on Locke's ideas. In his 1791 book, The Rights of Man, Paine wrote, It is a perversion of terms to say that a charter gives rights. It operates by a contrary effect, that of taking rights away. Rights are inherently in all the inhabitants, but charters, by annulling those rights in the majority, leave the right by exclusion in the hands of a few. They consequently are instruments of injustice. In other words, rights to life, liberty, and property don't come from governments or pieces of paper, but from being human. There were also a few historical precedents established by other documents limiting the powers of government. Examples of these include the Magna Carta of 1215, the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and the Virginia Declaration of Rights in 1776, written by revolutionary George Mason with help from James Madison. The Virginia Declaration became a framework for more than just the Bill of Rights. Its opening words state, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights. This phrase became the basis for the Declaration of Independence. For many of America's founding fathers, the whole reason for revolution was to obtain the individual sovereignty suggested by those words. Instead of being servants of a king or lord, they believed that everyone should have the right to control their own minds and bodies. This idea was almost completely unheard of in the 18th century. The vast majority of people around the world lived in extreme poverty, while working in service of lords often self-appointed through violent displays of force, or who had been granted authority by kings. 
Speaking out against the ruling class, organizing protests, or attempting to avoid paying taxes would often result in imprisonment, torture, or execution. In fact, many Enlightenment-era philosophers, such as Voltaire, found their works prohibited by governments all over Europe and even in America. Liberty is often fragile and has many enemies with both good and bad intentions, and it is never guaranteed. Many people throughout recorded history in the United States and around the world have fought and died to obtain equal protection of their rights under the law and the simple freedom to live their lives as they choose. Diverse influences contributed significantly to the creation of the Bill of Rights and its eventual ratification on December 15, 1791. Without the Founders' knowledge of philosophy and history and their active involvement in the American Revolution, American citizens today might never have enjoyed the freedom from government restrictions on the rights to speech and association, choice of religion, property ownership, or even the rights to self-defense and fair trials. This unique combination of cultural, historical, and philosophical influences produced what is arguably the most powerful tool for preventing tyranny ever created. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Amendment 3. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house, without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, and the persons or things to be seized. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury 
shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Amendment 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Fact is, it took a civil war right here in America to establish our foundation for freedom, a foundation that stands today, and America being established, it all begins, because freedom is not free. There were many more wars to preserve our freedoms. World War I followed. Historians say World War I was a senseless war, didn't accomplish anything. I would disagree with that. World War I was a huge leap in military technology. It brought about not only the thirst for bigger, better weapons, but it ushered in a future technology of weapons of mass destruction like the world has never seen before. From World War I and beyond, war would never be the same. War was now more ruthless and more brutal as any war in the past. World War I also polarized the sovereignty of many countries, and this is important, and you'll see why here shortly. It put into place ideologies that would bring more wars in the future. Now, the Associated Press ranked World War I as the eighth most important event of the 20th century. In fact, almost everything that subsequently happened occurred because of World War I. The Great Depression, World War II, the Holocaust, the Cold War, the collapse of empires. No event better underscores the utter unpredictability of the future. Europe hadn't fought a major war for a hundred years. A product of miscalculation, misunderstanding, miscommunication, the conflict might have been averted at many points during the five weeks up to the beginning of World War I. World War I destroyed four empires, the German Astro-Hungarian, the Ottoman, the Romanov, and it touched off colonial revolts in the Middle East and Vietnam. World War I shattered America's faith in reform and moral crusades. World War I carried far-reaching consequences from the home front, including prohibition, women's suffrage, and a bitter debate over civil liberties. Again, America is fighting for its freedom. World War I killed more people, 9 million combatants and 5 million civilians, and cost more money, $186 billion in direct costs and another $151 billion in indirect costs. This was more than any other previous war, even the Civil War. How did America get involved in World War I? You know, isolation was a, a long American tradition. Since the days of George Washington, Americans had struggled to remain protected by the mighty ocean of its borders. When European conflicts erupted, as they frequently did, many in the United States claimed exceptionalism. America was different. Why get involved in Europe's self-destruction? When the Archduke of Australia Hungary was killed in cold blood, it ignited the most destructive war in human history. The initial reaction in the United States was to be expected for neutrality. As a nation of immigrants, the United States would have real difficulty trying to pick a side, despite the obvious ties that the citizens had with Germany and Austria-Hungary as their parent lands. Support of either allies or the central powers might prove divisive, so America chose to stay neutral. Well, in the early days of the war, as Britain and France struggled against Germany, American leaders decided that it was in the national best interest to continue trade with all sides just like before. They said a neutral nation cannot impose an embargo on one side or the other and continue trade with one and not the other and retain its neutral status. On top of that, the United States merchants and manufacturers feared that a boycott would cripple the American economy. Great Britain, with its powerful navy, 
had different ideas. A major part of the British strategy was to impose a blockade on Germany. American trade with the Central Powers simply could not be permitted. The results of the blockade were astonishing. Trade with England and France more than tripled between 1914 and 1916, while trade with Germany was cut by nearly 90%. It was this situation that prompted submarine warfare by the Germans against Americans at sea. After two and a half years of isolationism, America entered the Great War, World War I. This was triggered by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of Austro-Hungarian Empire. World War I began in 1914 when Germany invaded Belgium and France. Several events led to the U.S. intervention, the sinking of the Lestuania, a British passenger liner, unrestricted German submarine warfare, and what's called the Zimmermann Note, which revealed a German plot to provoke Mexico to war against the United States. Millions of American men and women were drafted. A Congress created a war industry board to coordinate production and a national war labor board to unify labor policies. The Treaty of Versailles deprived Germany of territory and forced it to pay reparations. President Wilson agreed to the treaty because it provided for the establishment of a League of Nations. That's important. Remember that. But he was unable to persuade the Senate to ratify that particular treaty. So what were the consequences? Nearly 10 million soldiers died. About 21 million were wounded. U.S. deaths totaled 116,000 plus. During this same time, four empires collapsed. The Russian Empire in 1917, the German and Austro-Hungarian in 1918, and the Ottoman Empire in 1922. Independent Republicans were formed in Australia, Czechoslovakia, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, and Turkey. Most Arab lands that had been part of the Ottoman Empire came under the control of Britain or France. The Bolsheviks took power in Russia in 1917. Fascists triumphed in Italy in 1922. Other consequences of the war included the mass murder of Armenians in Turkey and an influenza epidemic that killed over 25 million people worldwide. Under the peace settlement, Germany was required to pay reparations, eventually said at about $33 billion. They had to accept responsibility for the war, cede territory to Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, France, and Poland, give up its overseas colonies, and accept an Allied military force on the west bank of the Rhine River for 15 years. It also ushered in a new kind of war, military firsts. It was the first major war in over 40 years. Both sides had amassed new weapons and new technology that had never been used before in actual combat. This was a new kind of war where soldiers were still learning how to use these weapons. It was a war with many firsts. It was the first time in war the use of tanks and trucks, airships and airplanes, submarines. The first time there was the use of machine guns, long-range artillery, exploding shells designed to do as much damage as possible by flying shrapnel, flamethrowers, and poisonous gas. World War I shaped the 20th century. It launched the United States as a world superpower, and it helped Commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand, and it helped them to find a sense of national identity, which is important, especially when we get to World War II and to the world as we know it today. World War I also fueled the Russian Revolution and her ascent as the world's first communist state. The First World War helped occupy countries like Poland, Yugoslavia, and Hungary to gain their independence. But it also set the stage for World War II only a couple decades later. So what did World War II bring us? World War II was the mightiest struggle mankind has ever seen. It killed more people, cost more money, damaged more property, affected more people, and caused more far-reaching changes in nearly every country than any other war in history. The number of people killed, wounded, or missing between September of 1939 and September of 1945 can never really be calculated. 
but it's estimated there were more than 55 million people that perished. 55 million. More than 50 countries took part in this war, and the whole world felt its effects. Men fought in almost every part of the world on every continent except Antarctica. Major battlegrounds included Asia, Europe, North Africa, the Atlantic, the Pacific Oceans, the Mediterranean Sea. The United States hoped to stay out of it because it was drawing on its experience from World War I. Congress had passed a series of neutrality acts between 1935 and 1939, which were intended to prevent Americans becoming entangled in these conflicts. Americans in general, however, while not wanting to fight the war, were definitely not neutral in their sympathies and the acts that were manipulated to the frustration of genuine isolationists to lend more support to the Allies than the Axis. Historians don't agree on the exact date when World War II began. Most consider the German invasion of Poland on September 1st of 1939 to be the beginning of the war. Others say that it started when the Japanese invaded Manchuria on September 18th of 31. Others even regard World War I, which culminated in the peace with the Central Powers in 1921 and World War II, as part of the same conflict, with only a breathing spell in between. Well, whichever the case, war officially began on September 1st, 1939, when Germany attacked Poland. Germany then crushed six countries in three months, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, and Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France, and proceeded to conquer Yugoslavia and Greece. Japan's plans for expansion in the Far East led it to attack Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. This is what brings the United States into the war. By early 1942, all major countries of the world were involved in the most destructive war in history. World War II would go down in the history books as bringing about the downfall of Western Europe as the center of a world power and leading to the rise of the Soviet Union's Socialist Republic, setting up conditions leading to the Cold War and opening up the nuclear age. So America prepares for war. After the war began in 1939, people in the Americans were divided on whether their country should even take part or stay out. Most Americans hoped the Allies would win, but they also hoped to keep the United States out of the war. The isolationists wanted the country to stay out of the war at almost any cost. Another group, the interventionists, wanted the United States to use all of its power to aid the Allies. Canada declared war on Germany almost at once while the United States shifted its policy from neutrality to preparedness. It began to expand its armed forces, build defensive plants, and give the Allies all-out aid short of war. President Franklin Roosevelt called upon the United States to be the great arsenal of democracy and supply war materials to the Allies through sales, lease, or loans. The land lease bill became law on March 11, 1941. During the next four years, the U.S. Senate sent more than $50 billion worth of war material to the Allies. In 1939, the United States had about 174,000 men in the Army. It had about 126,000 in the Navy, 26,000 in the Army Air Corps, 19,000 in the Marine Corps, and 10,000 in the Coast Guard. That was the size of our Army. At the height of its strength in 1945, the United States had 6 million in the Army, 3,400,000 in the Navy, 2,400,000 in the Army Air Corps, 484,000 in the Marine Corps, and 170,000 in the Coast Guard. In 1939, the United States had about 2,500 airplanes and 760 warships. By 1945, it had 80,000 airplanes and 2,500 warships. The United States used draft laws to build their armed forces. The United States Selective Service Act became the law September 16, 1940. Thousands of women served in the Army's Women Army Corps, the WACs, a Navy equivalent, the WAVES, standing for women accepted for volunteer emergency services. Factories of the United States converted from civilian to war production with amazing speed. Firms that had made vacuum cleaners before the war began to produce machine guns. As men went into armed forces, women took their place in the war plants. By 1943, more than 2 million women were working in American war industries, in shipyards, aircraft plants, 
Rosie the Riveter became a common sight. Officials discovered that women could perform the duties of eight or even ten jobs normally done by men. Urgent requirements for war materials caused many shortages in consumers' goods. Most governments, both allied and Axis, had to ration the amount of consumer goods each person could use. In the United States, rationed items were meat and butter and sugar, fat, oil, coffee, canned foods, shoes, and gasoline. Congress gave the president power to freeze prices, salaries, and wages at their levels of September 15, 1942. The United States imposed a special excise tax on such luxury items like jewelry and cosmetics. The government also set up a civil defense system to protect the country from attack. Many cities participated in blackouts, where cities on the Atlantic and Pacific coasts would dim their lights. Ordinarily, the glare from these lights made ships near the shore easy targets for submarines. And in the aftermath of World War II, it brought an end to the Depression everywhere. Industries had been ignited for the production of arms and resources to equip fighting forces. The man behind the man behind the gun helped win World War II. People on the home front built weapons, produced food and supplies. They bought war bonds. Historians believe that war production was the key to the Allied victory. The Allies not only mobilized more men and women in their armed forces, but also outproduced the Axis in weapons and machinery. Scientific inventions and discoveries also helped shorten the war. The United States organized its scientific resources in the Office of Scientific Research and Development. That government agency invented or improved such commodities as radar, rocket launchers, jet engines, amphibious assault boats, long-range navigational aids, devices for detecting submarines, and more. Science also made it possible to produce large quantities of penicillin to fight off a wide range of disease, as well as DDT to fight jungle disease that was caused by the insect. The war also solved problems, but it created many others. Germany had been the dominant power of the European continent. While Japan had held that role in Asia, the defeat of World War II left open positions of leadership. The Soviet Union moved quickly to replace positions as the most powerful country in Europe, also aimed at taking Japan's place as a dominant power in Asia. It turns out the communists under Mao Zedong affected the forces of Chiang Kai-shek and took over mainland China by the fall of 1949, with China, France, and Great Britain devastated and financially exhausted by the war, the United States and the Soviet Union became the two major powers of the world. Well, the Allies were determined not to repeat the mistakes of World War I, where Allies had failed to set up and organize and to enforce a peace until World War I ended. In June of 1941, nine European governments in exile joined with Great Britain and the Commonwealth countries in signing the Inter-Allied Declaration which called for nations to cooperate and work for lasting peace. So in 1944, an idea emerged to create a post-war international organization. Hence, the United Nations was born on October 24, 1945. Its first five sessions were held the following January in London. Also in 1945, the world changed again, this time with prophetic implications that the world had never seen. The atomic bomb, or the A-bomb, derives its explosive force from the release of nuclear energy through the fission, that's the splitting, of heavy atomic nuclei. The first atomic bomb was produced at the Los Alamos, New Mexico Laboratory and successfully tested on July 16, 1945. This was the culmination of a large U.S. Army program that was part of the Manhattan Project. It was led by Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, it began in 1940, two years after the German scientist Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann discovered nuclear fission. On August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima with an estimated equivalent explosive force of 12,500 tons of TNT, followed three days later by a second, more powerful bomb on Nagasaki. Both bombs caused widespread death, injury, and destruction. And for the first time in human history, a powerful end-time prophecy could now be realized. Let me give you three of those. Second Peter 3.10 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Zechariah 14.12 says, In the last days God will bring a plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all of the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth while they stand. Joel 2.30 says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. In the original Greek, the word pillar is sometimes used to describe a palm tree. This is the same description as the mushroom cloud that comes from a nuclear blast. Just keep that in mind as we go forward here. Atomic bombs were then developed by the USSR in 1949, Great Britain in 1942, France in 1960, China in 1964, a number of other nations, particularly India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea now have atomic bombs and the capability to produce them. South Africa formerly possessed a small arsenal. The three smaller Soviet successor states that inherited nuclear arsenals were Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. They relinquished all nuclear warheads, which had been removed to Russia. And just as a point of fact, when the atomic bomb went over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, 70,000 lives were ended in a flash. These people were vaporized. They were dead before they had the chance to fall down. However, this madness had just begun. That August morning was the day that heralded the dawn of the nuclear age. And with it came more than just the loss of lives. What had happened at Hiroshima was not only that a great scientific breakthrough had occurred and that a great part of the population of the city had been burned to death, but the problem of the relation of the triumphs of modern science to the human purpose of man had been explicitly defined. The entire globe was now to live with the fear of total annihilation. This was the same fear that drove the Cold War. And that fear has forever changed the world of politics. This fear is real. And it's more real today than ever because of the ease of making a nuclear bomb in this day and age sparks fear in the heart of most people on this planet. According to General Douglas MacArthur, he said, We have had our last chance. If we do not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The justification for nuclear arms is that every nation has an interest in being at peace with other nations, but there's never been a time when the world was free from this scourge of war. So peaceful nations must have enough military force at their disposal in order to detour or defeat the aggression of rogue nations. Finally, we can never forget the axiom of Edmund Burke, who said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. World War II took the lives of more people than any other war in history. Eastern Europe and East Asia suffered the heaviest losses. Germany and the Soviet Union and the nations that had been ground between them may have lost as much as a tenth of their population. World War II eclipsed the Civil War and World War I and had become the most expensive war in history. It's been estimated the cost of the war totaled between $1 and $2 trillion dollars and the property damage amounted to more than $239 billion. The United States spent about 10 times as much as it had spent in all previous wars put together. The national debt rose at the time from $42 billion in 1940 to $269 billion in 1946. And from here came the idea of this United Nations. Created in 1945... Representatives of 50 countries met in San Francisco at the United Nations Conference on International Organization to draw up the United Nations Charter. Those delegates deliberated on the basis of proposals that were worked out by the representatives of China and the Soviet Union, the UK, the United States, and in Dumbarton Oaks on August of 1944, the charter was signed on 26 June 1945 by the representatives of 50 countries. The United Nations officially came into existence when the Charter had been ratified by China and France, Soviet Union. So let's take a look at the United Nations. What does the United Nations say about itself? 
They say the UN General Assembly is the only universally represented body of the five principal organs of the United Nations. The other major bodies are the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the International Court of Justice, as delineated in the Charter of the United Nations. The function of the General Assembly is to discuss, debate, and make recommendations on a range of subjects pertaining to international peace and security, including development, disarmament, human rights, international law, peaceful arbitration between disputing nations. It elects the non-permanent members of the Security Council and other bodies, such as the Human Rights Council. It appoints the Secretary General based on the Security Council's recommendations. It considers reports from the other four organs of the United Nations. It assesses the financial situation of member states. It approves of the UN budget. That's its most concrete role. The Assembly also works with the Security Council to elect the judges of an international court of justice. Now, this is what the United Nations says about themselves. From 1945 to now, what have they become? I'm Ed Griffin. I'm an author, researcher. I've written some books. Um, I've written a book most recently of interest called The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve System. And I've written other things on the United Nations called The Fearful Master. I wrote a book on uh, natural cancer research and therapy called uh, World Without Cancer. Well, the United Nations is different things to different people. Most people think that the UN is our last best hope for peace. That's the way it was uh, sold to me when I was in school. Uh, it was uh, offered as an organization uh, where different nations could come together and work out their problems and their grievances in a peaceful manner and um, be a means of uh, reducing world conflict and increasing the economic prosperity of all of the member nations and all of these wonderful things. In reality, it turns out to be none of the above. In reality, the United Nations is a, a, the seat of what the member governments hope will become a true world government. It's to be a government. And there's nothing inherently wrong with a world government, but we need to ask the question, what kind of a world government is this going to be? If the United Nations were going to be a government based on all of the things they've said it was going to be, peace and prosperity and protecting individual rights and all of these things, I think it would be pretty hard to oppose it. But in reality, it's being built as a model of collectivism. The political ideology that is inherent in the United Nations is collectivism. It's a word that probably needs to be defined for our purposes here, but in general it means a totalitarian system, a system of uh, concentration at the top and the people being at the bottom being ruled from above. Not that the people have any voice in determining the direction of their government or the world, but they are to be told what the direction is, and they're to be told to follow it. Collectivism is a philosophy of big government and small people, and it's a philosophy that supposedly uh, all of this is being done in the name of society. In other words, it's for the greater good of the greater number, supposedly. And so you're supposed to go along with whatever inconvenience or uh, insult to your freedom comes along, because after all, it's in the greater good uh, of the greater number. And this is the, the rationale being used, has been used for quite some time, to justify all kinds of horrible atrocities. All the leaders have to do is say, well, it's for the greater good of the greater number. That's the philosophy that's built into the United Nations from top to bottom. And so therefore, the answer to the question, what is the United Nations? The United Nations is a budding or building world totalitarian system. Uh, the United States has always been the major supporter and financer of the United Nations. So you'd have to say that the key people behind the United Nations are the globalists, I think is the best word to use to describe them, in the United States. Now who are they? They would be politicians, they would be people in the State Department, and they would be international financiers. You must remember, for example, that the, the land uh, where the United Nations is uh, 
seated was purchased by the Rockefellers and donated to uh, the United Nations. Well, they didn't do that as a, as a means of uh, uh, being great humanitarians, although that's the image that many people have. They did because they had a keen interest in building this new world order, and they thought this would be the seat for it, and so that's why they did that. So the people behind it in the United States are the international financiers who are located here, the, primarily the Rockefeller Group, and what's left to the old J.P. Morgan Group, and some of the larger banks. But primarily, um, you find most of these people in an organization uh, that is uh, not well known, but definitely very important. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a group in the United States with about 4,000 members at the most. And yet these people, number one, are all dedicated to building a new world order, a global government, based on the model of collectivism. And number two, you find them at the tops of most of the important organizations in this country. You find them in government. About half of our presidents and vice presidents and uh, just about all of our secretaries of state and secretaries of defense and heads of the CIA and the FBI and all of the important positions in government. If you look at who these people are over the years, they're members of this Council on Foreign Relations. Most of the great universities they have as their president or their board of directors dominated members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The news channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, the Turner Broadcasting System, uh, Murdoch. I mean, Murdoch is a well-known member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So all of these major power centers of society are in the hands of this small group, under 4,000 members. And so you ask who's behind it. If you want a list, that's a good place to start. Uh, write to the Council on Foreign Relations office in uh, New York, as I have done every year, and I ask for a membership report or an annual report. And in the back of each report, they proudly list all of their members. So that's where you find who is behind the United Nations. That's a hard word for many people to accept or, or a phrase, to accept that we have an internationalist elite. A lot of people believe that, you know, in this country, we're the... Uh, masters of our own political destiny. We don't have an elite. Maybe we have some rich people. Yes, we have some powerful people. But the idea of an elite or an international elite, elite is foreign to the thinking of a lot of Americans. But the truth is we do have one. And their intention is to, number one, maintain their positions of uh, being the elite, having uh, vast power and control and financial wealth. And number two, to extend it to the international level. Uh, we have these international elites, we call them international, but basically they're housed in each nation. We have them in England and France and the United States and Germany and so forth. And now the big move among these people is to coalesce into a true international elite whereby uh, they will be operating through the, the governmental power of the United Nations. Now uh, they, uh, they really have clout because there's no nation in the world that can escape their power because the, the way these people work is that they, if they want to accomplish something, if they have an agenda, uh, let's just pick one at, uh, at random, a disarmament or another one, uh, population control or something like that, uh, as it is now they have to convince each of the respective nations and their governments to implement those agendas. But once you have a true United Nations with a true governmental power, with uh, real military forces, and once you have uh, turned over to these uh, uh, these agencies of international power control over your armies and over your air force and over your weapons of mass destruction, you have created a global government which is uh, cannot be challenged by any nation whatsoever. So now these international elites do not have to worry about uh, convincing the governments in each uh, part of the world, as long as they control the center of this power, which is the United Nations, they therefore can control the world. It's a very heady wine, I'm sure, and, but that's what their objective is. But uh, the obligation of the United States to the United Nations on a legal front uh, has become entwined in these things we call treaties. So if you're talking as a globalist, uh, or as an internationalist and you want to see the building of this new world order, you would say that our obligation to the United Nations is legal and it's binding because the United Nations has the status of a treaty. 
And then we have all these sub-treaties that follow along after it, NAFTA and GATA, GATA and all of these organizations that are created, those are all based on treaty agreements. And so piece by piece, they've been weaving this fabric around this, like the little, so, uh, the little silk threads uh, that the Lilliputians wrapped around uh, who was uh, Gulliver, <laughs> Gulliver's travels. I mean, any one thread you could break, but Gulliver woke up one morning and he had these thousands of little threads around his body, and although he was a giant compared to them, he could not move, they had captured him. So I think that's basically what's going on. And in that sense, we have this obligation to the United Nations because we're being bound down by thousands of treaties, and uh, it's destroying our independence. And of course, this is the foundation for the United States Agenda 21 Climate Change Initiative. What does Agenda 21 have to do with this? Well, according to the Urban Climate Change Governance Survey, it's a report of 350 participating cities across the globe. Preparations for climate change are being added into basic urban planning along with economic development priorities. The report claims that 75% of cities worldwide now tackle climate change issues as a mainstream part of their planning, climate change mitigation, and climate adaptation. That is, they're trying both to reduce emissions and greenhouse gases and to adapt to a long-term changes that are already in motion. Only 21% of cities report tangible connections between the response to climate change and achieving other local development goals. But last year, Beaverton, Oregon, became one of the first of 100 cities across the nation to be indoctrinated into the Obama administration's Revitalizing Roundtable Initiative to collaborate local government leaders throughout the U.S. and federal program leaders with senior officials from federal agencies, all part of Agenda 21. The city of Beaverton was awarded $1.6 million from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention under the Community Transformation Program to construct a new governmental health center for the local community to utilize. Now, in conjunction with the Beaverton Urban Development Agency, Beaverton city officials are expecting to be granted more funds from the EPA's Smart Growth Technical Assistance Grant Program. Senator Suzanne Bonamici praised officials from the city of Beaverton for their participation in the initiative for sustainable revitalization. In the report, commissioned by Nexus Community Partners entitled Engaging Communities for Sustainable Revitalization, key trends are strategies and recommendations that focus on addressing social and economic changes in urban cities across the nation must be directed to the engagement of community revitalization. Through sustainability as a core philosophy, a coercion of community participation, Residents of any city that could be made to accept a lifestyle in a density population urban center under the pretext of environmental consciousness. In conjunction with the Beaverton Urban Redevelopment Agency, in a report commissioned by Nexus Community Partners, entitled Engaging Community for Sustainable Redevelopment, Revitalization, Key Trends, Strategies, and Recommendations, the focus of addressing social and economic changes. Schemes were devised to provide for trust building with a focus on public and public-private partnerships, which is Agenda 21 language, to facilitate sustainable business development and indoctrinate the ideology of Agenda 21 into the social fabric for future projects. Now, this is not conspiracy theory. I know this is true because I live here. I broadcast from Oregon. Beaverton is not far from where I live. Here's a brief breakdown of Agenda 21. Please listen to this clip. What is Agenda 21? The constitutionalist movement has heard vague echoes in recent years about a threat to the free economy from this Agenda 21. Well, Agenda 21 is not new. The New American Magazine and its affiliate, the John Birch Society, were one of the few constitutionalist organizations that was present when it was drawn up back at the 1992 Earth Summit on Climate Change in Rio de Janeiro. The summit, organized by the United Nations, brought together the most extreme environmental activists from around the world to deal with the supposed threat from global warming. 
and Agenda 21 was the document they drew up. The New Americans' William F. Jasper attended the conference as a reporter and was able to report on events at the Rio Summit as they happened. And he's been reporting on them for some 20 years ever since, including the Wildlands Project, which would take most of America outside of the habitable zone for human beings in order to make room for the animals. What came out of this Rio summit in 1992 was summed up by the radical environmentalists themselves. And one United Nations approved introduction to the Agenda 21 document claimed that, quote, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both government and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action to be integrated into individual and collective decision-making at every level. The document leaves no one alone, stating, quote, there are specific actions which are intended to be undertaken by, in short, every person on Earth. What it means for Americans is more than just an end to fossil fuels. It means a lower standard of living. And the strategy for implementing Agenda 21 was a much broader strategy than ever attempted by the environmentalist movement. They sought global treaties and national legislation, as in the past. They also sought to shame individuals and corporations into changing their behavior on a voluntary basis. That, too, was not new. But they also began fighting for what's called soft law changes to consumers' living standards. Soft law is the use of centralized governments to bribe with aid or regulations either smaller governmental subunits, such as states and localities, or private companies for following ever more stringent eco-standards with tax breaks or outright cash aid. On the state and local level, the push for soft law is led by the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, or ICLE, which had been founded a couple of years before the Rio Summit. More than 1,000 state, county, and municipal government organizations around the world are ICLE members and are pushing this radical environmentalist agenda with bribes and stiffer regulations. In many American towns, local officials boast about the impact of ICLE in the form of putting state rebate checks on display for properly following new environmentalist incentives. For example, Job Bird Society New England Regional Director Hal Shirtliff was able to point out that Here is what's disturbing. Here is a check. May note to the city of Newburyport from Ma Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And why is this check on display? Well, this is the second such check that I have found in a city or town that belongs to the ICLEI, International Council on Local Environmental Initiative which is a government-to-government -government entity, unconstitutional on its face, and uh, their goal is to implement Agenda 21, what they call soft law, uh, that came out of the Rio Conference in 1992. Very hostile to property rights, uh, freedoms, and, and uh, any town or city official who thinks somehow being part of this is going to help the communities is gravely mistaken. ICLEI has become a big part of the subsidy and regulation regime on the state and local level, but it's not the only part of the eco-subsidy agenda. That also extends to the White House, where President Obama has called for government to start picking winners and losers in the markets for more energy-efficient products. President Obama boasted in his May 6, 2011 weekly address that... But over the long term, the only way we can avoid being held hostage to the ups and downs of oil prices is if we reduce our dependence on oil. That means investing in clean, alternative sources of energy, like advanced biofuels and natural gas. And that means making cars and trucks and buses that use less oil. Other countries know this, and they're going all in to invest in clean energy technologies and clean energy jobs. This is part of the reason why huge corporations such as General Electric were able to claim a $3.25 billion tax credit in 2010 paying no corporate income taxes that year.
GE cashed in on federal tax credits for green projects, such as its wind turbine project. Of course, nobody objects to private companies offering more fuel-efficient automobiles or creating products that don't fill up landfills. The problem with ICLEI and, and Agenda 21 is that they primarily seek governments to pick the winners and the losers in the marketplace. Governments usually pick the wrong winners. That was the lesson from the housing bubble of the last decade. The federal government promoted home ownership by subsidies, tax credits, and suppression of interest rates and crashed the whole economy. Government doing the same thing on green jobs will do the same thing to the economy on a much larger scale. Agenda 21 is based on man-made global warming. Without it, Agenda 21 would be null and void. So you can see why they work so hard to make sure the idea of man-made global warming is made to be true. This would set up the United Nation as a global governing power with global control and international laws and courts. It would all be enforced on a community level just to make sure every single person in the world had no way to avoid it. All of this could be the final setup for a one world leader. If they have international courts, international laws, if one person took control of the UN under Agenda 21, he would be a one world leader who would have the power to make or break peace treaties. After all, the United Nations says peace through global laws and global courts is one of their main goals. If you remember about a week ago, I reported that there's a move to replace the U.S. passport with a regional passport, a North American passport for America, Canada, Mexico, and Cuba. America would have to give up her sovereignty to do that. This means all of the lives lost, sacrificed for our freedom since the Civil War through right now would be wasted. Our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers will have died for nothing. If this comes about, we will have a ready-to-go system to fulfill another end-time prophecy, a one-world leader, a one-world government, this new world order. This is what the prophecy calls the Antichrist, this one-world leader, because he will be against everything that's good and decent. Revelation 13.5 speaks of this time of a great tribulation of 42 months, that's seven years, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Listen to this clip from Dave Reagan. I see us on the threshold of the tribulation. There are four key prophecies concerning uh, the end times. One is that the Jewish people are going to be regathered from the four corners of the earth. That took place beginning in the 1880s and going through the 20th century. Second, that the state of Israel is going to be reestablished, which occurred on May 14, 1948. The third, that the Jews would reoccupy the city of Jerusalem, which occurred on June the 6th, 1967. And the fourth prophecy, that all the world would come together against Israel over the issue of Jerusalem. That's where we are right now. And that means we are right on the threshold of the tribulation. Second Thessalonians says this, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. He will speak against the Most High. He will oppress the holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered unto his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. Now we know that a time is a year. Times, plural, is two years. A half a time is a half a year. They're saying that in this seven-year period, he will have dominion for half of this. He will have power over every nation, kindred, and tongue. He will be a one world leader. Now through the last hundred years, through all of these wars especially, not only have we gained in power to actually destroy the earth probably two or three times over, but we have also set it up to a point where this could actually happen, where one person could actually be in control of the entire world. If they can set up Agenda 21, sustainable development through climate change, and force everybody into this, with one world leader, he would have the power to do this. He could change the times and the laws. The Bible warns that the wrath of God will be poured out on unrepentant sinners. These judgments described in Revelation include worldwide war, both conventional and nuclear. 
famine, plagues, wild animals attacking humans, meteor impacts, massive global earthquakes, and the start of these terrible judgments commence at the beginning of this seven-year trial period, which is marked by the signing of a seven-year peace treaty between the Antichrist and Israel, because all of this is going to happen in the Middle East. And everyone knows right now the Middle East is upside down. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it'll start an arm race of nuclear weapons over there with a bunch of ideologues who want to kill everybody. It also says this tribulation period is divided in two halves, each in three and a half year lengths. The second half of the seven year tribulation period will be even worse than the first half. It's a time known as the Great Tribulation. The Great Three and a Half Years will begin the Antichrist's violation of the treaty that he signs with Israel. The last hundred years plus have been like no other hundred year period in human history. End time prophecy in the last hundred years has come to pass more than any other time. Now, if you're one who says you don't believe all of this end time stuff is going to happen, then you must believe that the nuclear age, terrorist nations like Iran about to get the bomb, United Nations so close to global control, financial system out of control all over the world, they're genetically modifying our food, the world's moral collapse, all kinds of disease mutating all over the world, Fukushima radiating our Pacific Ocean, you must think all of this is just going to go away. The Middle East and Russia and the Western nations will frolic in a field of daisy, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. Don't worry, everything will be fine, right? I think that's fear and refusal to accept the world the way it is. All of this is leading somewhere. This is something to think about. And we will cover more of this in future programs. In the meantime, you can contact me at contact at wdeanshook.com. The homepage is wdeanshook.com. You can get me on Twitter. That's wdeanshook. Facebook is wdeanshook. And don't forget to download the End Time News app. You can get it for your Android at Google Play, or you can get it for your iPhone in the App Store. It's absolutely free. Download it today and stay connected to the Signs of the Times. I'll see you on our next program. And think about what we talked about today. Thank you. You can get these full stories and more at wdeanshook.com. That's wdeanshook.com.